Read the Bible every day so you'll be full of faith. Welcome you to join Bible Links to read the entire Bible in two years. I believe God will bless you, He will lift you up, and your life will never be the same. The Gospel According to Matthew Chapter 3 John the Baptist Prepares the Way In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brew of vipers who warn you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from the stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Baptism of Jesus Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill our righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a doll and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, for whom I am well pleased. Chapter 4 The Temptation of Jesus then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Jesus begins his ministry. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. 
and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus calls the first disciples. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen, and he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus ministers to great crowds, and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds follow him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. The following is the English translation of Pastor Mullen Wu's teachings on the Gospel Book of Matthew, chapters 3 and 4, translated by David. Read the Bible every day and you'll be full of faith. The spiritual principle we must pay attention to in Matthew chapters 3 and 4 involved the preparation of the way before the king. As seems with John the Baptist's ministry preparing the path and straightening the way for Jesus, Jesus himself was baptized and then led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Afterwards, he called his disciples using the word follow. So in chapter 3 and 4 today, as Christians, there are several spiritual principles closely related to our lives that we should grasp tightly. First, from the verse 1 to verse 12, we must recognize John the Baptist's ministry, which was a ministry of voice in preparing hearts. Verse 2 speaks of kingdom of heaven being at hand and the call to repentance. Verse 3 refers to Isaiah's prophecy about preparing the weight of the Lord. Therefore, our prayer of response should be, Lord, help me also become your voice today just as John the Baptist did initially, appearing to wait as a forerunner. His work was to bring about repentance in people's hearts, and he still a reverence for God. So as Christians today, our first prayer should be, Lord, may I also become your voice, Lord Jesus, that you are coming again, that you are coming soon. In my voice, one that leads to repentance, or is my life the one that enables other others to see repentance entering into salvation of the Lord? How important is that? John the Baptist's ministry consists of two aspects. First, in verse 2, the kingdom of heaven was at hand, calling for repentance. Second, from verses 10 to 12, he reminded them that the axe was already laid at the roots of the trees, and every tree that didn't produce good fruit would be cut down and thrown into the fire. He particularly mentioned that the one who was to come after him is mightier than he, who would baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire. John the Baptist's ministry consists of two aspects. First, bringing about repentance through baptism, leading people truly into the kingdom of God. Secondly, reminding those who are descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people, to pay attention to one thing. Whether they bear fruit, they must truly understand that being baptized into the kingdom means being managed by a king who will baptize us with the Holy Spirit in fire. Verse 12 states that he holds the one knowing fork in his hand and will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. This is the kingdom of God. He is the master who gathers the wheat into the barn 
and burns the chaff with unquenchable fire, referring to judgment. Therefore, John the Baptist's ministry is about bringing repentance and installing a fear of God, because there is, there will be judgment in the future. As Christians today, we need to examine ourselves, our lives. When spreading the gospel today and leading people to believe in the Lord, am I presenting a true path of repentance for them to recognize? And after they believe in the Lord, am I helping them to lead a life of fearing God and waiting for Christ's return for judgment, enjoying God's love, but also revering Him? I am not belittling the work and the sharing of the gospel. It is crucial, however, some people lead others to believe without guiding them into a life of repentance. They say, believe in Jesus and you will be blessed. Believe in Jesus that you will be healed. Believe in Jesus that you will have a happy family. And believe in Jesus, God will bless all your desires. Who wouldn't want such a blessing from God? But John the Baptist's voice was a voice of repentance. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Today, when I lead someone in a prayer of salvation, I need to make them understand that they must live a life of repentance and for their past sins and for not knowing God, that we can lead them to truly repent and accept Jesus Christ into their hearts. Moreover, we need to remind them to live a life worthy of repentance and to await Christ's return for judgment. We must pay attention to this. Otherwise, leading someone into a simple prayer of salvation might mislead them into thinking that they have already entered heaven without their true repentance or a fruitful life, without caring whether Christ will come to judge. They might just say that, I will enter heaven in the future, and such simplistic, simplistic prayer of salvation are very dangerous. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, John the Baptist's voice is highly relevant to us today, as it is the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is my life a voice that can help people repent and enter the kingdom of heaven? Am I helping people lead a fruitful life after entering the kingdom? Am I helping them to live a life of repentance, awaiting Christ's return for judgment? If so, they will live a life of sincere reverence, love for the Lord, seeking His rebirth, and being led by the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to prepare the way for Him and to make His path straight. So, dear family, let you and me become kingdom voices in our lives, whether in our workplaces or at home. So why do so many people not believe in the Lord? Why do many fail to enter salvation? Sometimes, when they observe our lives, they stumble, seeing our lifestyle patterns, loving the world, being greedy, unforgiving and being immersed in the fear and worry of this world, they wonder, why should I believe in your God? Our lives must be a voice that leads people into the kingdom, a voice of repentance, not living the same worldly life, but living a life that enters the kingdom, that we must bear fruit, and the axe is already at the root of the trees. Every tree that doesn't, doesn't bear fruit will be cut down. This is the severe warning meant to make people afraid, but in reality, it helps them. Through fear, they will understand God's love and receive His salvation. This also reminds us that God will cleanse His threshing floor and burn the chaves in the unquenchable fire. That this speaks about eternal judgment, that we must prepare ourselves. Now from verses 13 to 17, he talks about the second aspect, the baptism of Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God. Yet he stands in the position of a man, in the role of a king, that he had to undergo baptism. He had to face temptations. Thus, through his actions, he demonstrates the righteousness that we must show. Jesus Christ was sinless, yet he underwent baptism to show us how every person must respect the value of baptism as a means to enter the kingdom. Many people have been in the church for a long time claiming to be devout followers, yet they haven't been baptized. They might say, I haven't been baptized, but my life is better than that person who hasn't been baptized. I am not baptized because I am waiting for this or that. But as long as you haven't been baptized, you don't understand what righteousness is. It means putting ourselves within the demands of God's righteousness. Within the scope of God's righteousness, not being baptized means you have not 
met the requirements of this righteousness. That you haven't entered into the realm of his righteousness means reaching the requirement, bringing ourselves into the scope of it, into the kingdom. Many people fulfill the requirement of righteousness by being baptized, but they don't live within the scope of it. Therefore, when the baptisms of Jesus Christ, you will find that Holy Spirit descendant in Jesus Christ receive a light from the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, this is a manifestation of the glory of the tribunal in God. But it also reminds us, after you're baptized, are you living within the realm of righteousness? Is your life governed by the Holy Spirit? Does your life please the Heavenly Father? Or are you living to please yourself? Living life according to your own desires and not caring whether the Holy Spirit is in control or whether or not Heavenly Father is pleased with you. At least you are pleased with with your, at least you're pleasing with yourself and you're just waiting to enter heaven. But if you are not connected to the life of God, that your baptism in mind don't mean entering into all righteousness. Turning to the life of righteousness has two crucial, crucial principles. First, submitting to the demand and requirement of it. Secondly, living within the scope of righteousness and within the realm of a righteous life. It is the manifestation of God's glory. It is God's judgment of holiness, sanctity, and sin. Righteousness belongs to God. Therefore, we have submitted ourselves to God through baptism. After baptism, do we cherish His Word? And after baptism, do we always long for an intimate relationship with Christ? After baptism, do we care about every move and guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Do we obey? Do we care about the pleasure of the Heavenly Father? All these are what it means to enter into His righteousness. This is also a requirement for entering into the kingdom and into His service. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. These temptations were within the context of His kingship and His position. Just after His baptism, a voice from heaven declare, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This was enough to provide that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. However, the devil's temptation wasn't about denying or doubting whether or not Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Instead, every temptation from the evil one was aimed at causing Jesus Christ to depart from his position as the Son of God, tempting him to test God, which humans cannot do. Satan knew very well that back in the Garden of Eden, through the temptation of food, the temptation of disobey God's word, and the distortion of God's word, that he made Adam fail. And this sense persists end to today. Even today, that Adam is behind the scenes, and still in these three temptations, that he is not standing in the position of Son of God, that he's standing in the position of Son of Man overcoming and patient. So it tells us one thing. This tells us one thing, dear brothers and sisters. The life of Jesus Christ is within me. He has also undergone every temptations, but he did not sin. This indicates that when we have the life of Jesus Christ within us, that we can overcome temptations. That these three temptations continuously tested Jesus Christ in the past. Although the temptations ended, there were still temptations to come. Today, these three temptations are also present in the lives of many Christians. So we need to learn one thing. To, so help me. So that today in my life, that I have the life of Son of God and the life of Jesus Christ within me. And I can overcome these three temptations. Now, the first temptation is also known as the temptations turn stone into bread. You might think after fasting for 40 days, feeling hungry and thirsty, what harm is there in having a piece of bread? This is a basic need of life. Jesus doesn't deny our physical needs. Instead, Jesus Christ reminds us that first and foremost is that life does not consist solely of food, but it is by the word that which comes from the mouth of God. Jesus Christ tells us that the most important thing in life is our need for God's word, that we will try to satisfy our various physical needs through our own abilities conveniently and habits. This is not wrong, but 
I have no money and I will find a way. When I have no food, I'll find a way. When faced with difficulties, I'll find a way. When experience financial shortage, I will find a way. But among all our attempts to find solutions, do we often turn to God and say, God, I need your word to guide me. I need your word to provide for me. I need your word to help me. Have you made this your priority? This temptation will still exist in your Christian's lives. Yes, you and I will encounter economic pressures, workplace stress, interpersonal relationships, and even challenges to our dreams and hopes in life. So when temptation comes, it is also the test. What is our first reaction? Do we have the ability to solve it? Do we have a way to solve it? No money, I can borrow. No job, I'll change jobs. In sick, when I get sick, I quickly go to the doctors. I know some good doctors, but it's not about denying these actions. But do you know whether or not you seek God's word, guidance, provision, and help first? Can you make this your top priority, letting God's word guide us? Whatever he says, we do. God's word guide us to see a doctor. We'll go to a doctor. God's guidance leads us to do something that we'll do it. So everything is not done just by ourselves or for ourselves. That the first temptation is whether that you can make God's word, God's guidance, and God's leadership, and God's way your first priority in solving problems. But Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. The second temptation, Satan took Jesus to the pinnacle of a temple and wanted him to throw himself down there, even calling scripture saying, For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up unless you strike your foot against the stone. This temptations in the temple echoes the temptations in the Garden of Eden. Here, the revelation of God's word seems to say so. To a kind of proving, depending on a single verse of a scripture without considering the, its context or the entire biblical narrative. I just take a verse because I have a need and I declare, Oh, God's word supports me. Jesus Christ said that this is testing God and not testing whether in your God will support you. Dear family, today we often engage in such behavior. It is frightening. To satisfy my inner pride, to satisfy my desire for special spiritual experiences, and to, to satisfy my sense of being different from others, I search for a verse in my experiences, in my encounter that fits what I want. Then I say, Oh, this is God's confirmation. This is God's guidance. This is God's help. Human tendencies are frightening. That I have a tendency towards love, towards money, towards my reputation, towards my image. I care a lot about these. So you'll find that when these tendencies dominate you, and as soon as you read the Bible, and you'll find a verse that supports you, and the word seems to confirm it, the environment seems to confirm it, dear family, this is not God's guidance. This is testing God. So what is tempting? And what is testing God? It is when I decide to act first and then look for God's word to support me. This is tempting. What is obedience to God? God speaks. I act accordingly. I don't have my own tendencies, my own ambitions, or my own desire to suppress, suppress everything. And like the kind of longing, all I want is the Lord. When you speak, I boldly act. When you forbid, I stop. When you guide, I follow. And let go of your tendencies and let God guide us. Otherwise, dear family, we we'll often encounter such things in life today. Let's say today a beautiful sister who loved God dearly show up at church. When human tendency dominates, when that happens, ten brothers will all pray and feel God is guiding them today. Isn't that right? Or today there is an opportunity for financial gain, a change for promotions. And after I pray, all I have to do is to make a small gesture to please my supervisor, give a small gift, and God will guide me. Suddenly, I see scripture saying that gifts are a way to bring people before kings. So dear family, all of this is testing God. It is when I already have a tendency and I've decided what to do, and then I use God's word to support me. Now, the, the devil often uses this method, method to make you think that you are walking on the true path of God when you're actually turning away from God. Prophet Balaam was like this, wasn't he? God said not to go, but he kept asking God. 
can I go? When the others asked him, he said, God, can I go? And he really went. Then God wanted to kill him. You see, someone who doesn't, doesn't understand God's will does everything according to their own tendencies, always testing God. Third temptation, Satan took Jesus to a high mountain. Show him that the splendor of the world, the glory of the nations, and the glory of the whole secular world. Actually, this is the lust of the eyes. Jesus Christ said, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. We all desire success. Who doesn't want money? Who doesn't want abundance? Who doesn't want to live a more comfortable life? But your choice, that your path, is it to worship Mammon or worship Jesus Christ. Many times that we falter in this choice. If I just lean in towards the world a little and rely on the world a little more, if I could just conform to the world a little bit, that I don't have to be too insistent, too absolute. Actually, we can live quite well in this world. But if today that you solely want to worship God and make God your priority in your life, then you should have to make many choices. It is not about whether that this thing is worth it or not. It's about whether you know who you are worshiping. Are you worshiping God, the holy God, the one true God, the all-powerful God? The, um, or is it not? Is it difficult to make these decisions in your life? If you understand this, if you just think, should I take this or leave this? Or should I want this or not? Can I have this or not? It's really difficult. If you look at yourself, that your choices will be difficult. But if you worship God, if your object is God, then you're simply serving and saying, I want your will. Many things in your life will become simple. Such temptations still exist within the Christian church. So repeatedly, constantly, and every brothers and sisters for thousands of years, some overcome, some stumble, and some are trapped in the cycle, and some emerge. In God's kingdom, pouring ourselves out for, the God, for God and pleasing Him. So, dear family, can we, in the midst of temptations, rely on the Word of God and step forward gradually? Today, in your workplace, in your relationships, in the lives of those you love, in the things that you cherish, these three things, desires of the flesh, pride of the life, and the lust of ice, are still tempting us today. What is your choice? Is God's Word your priority? Do you obey God's guidance? Do you not test God? Do you let go of your own tendencies? Do you know clearly what I prioritize God so every choice in my life will be simple? What is your choice? So after the temptations from verse 12 onwards, Jesus Christ began to recruit co-workers in his kingdom, choosing people to participate in his ministry. Dear family, have you been chosen? Every trial in life is not. Suffer, just suffering in vain. Every situation and decision in life is not just suffering in vain. So don't think that we really sacrifice some things for the kingdom of God. Behind every choice, every sacrifice, and every renouncement, every abandonment, Jesus Christ is called. That the glorious destiny is calling. When you become a Christian today, when you were baptized, have you passed the test? In the test, that you closely follow Jesus Christ? Do you know you are called? In this call, Matthew used a very special word. Not only it called Peter and Andrew, it was actually the second call because they have followed Jesus Christ and went back to fishing. So when Jesus called them again, found the faith in the Lord, Jesus called them to follow him. The Greek word used was to take, which means to follow behind. But when he called John James, he began, and he used another word, aglotheo, which was means to not only to follow behind, but also to go in a company and walk side by side. Matthew used the word to teach us that a called person, besides following closely behind Jesus Christ, we must also learn to walk with the Lord. Now, both pairs of brothers immediately abandon everything in every abandonment in your life. Every letting go actually pulls you closer and closer to walking with the Lord. Many people in times of danger, suffering, illnesses, disasters, storms, often pray, God, you didn't answer me. The key is what? You may be in a stage of testing right now, that you may be in a stage of training, 
that you may be in a stage of temptations, a stage of wilderness. In this stage, you need to follow God closely. God wants to make your path straight and make our way smooth and reign with him within us, that he wants to make us his pleasing children. But after the test and when his call comes, can you and I be ready? Abandoning all this, dear family, whether you are working in a workplace or have a good job or serving in the church with a good ministry, we're stepping onto this distant path, step by step, closely following. But today, we're not only following behind Christ, we also need to learn to how to walk with Christ side by side. The key is today, how much have you let go? How much have you sacrificed? And how much have you set aside your own tendencies, your old self, your natural ambitions? It determines how closely that we are to the kingdom of God and how close that we are to our God living within the realm of God's kingdom. Chapters 3 and 4 teach us to follow the footsteps of the king, that we're not just preparing a way of voice through baptisms that we live within the realm of meaning, through trials that we find God's pleasure, that we have a life without sin. In the end, we embark on a glorious destined journey, following behind the Lord, walking in unison with them. The glory of God has given us. Amen. Dear families, we hope that you enjoy the Bible race as much as we do. If you are willing to volunteer to translate the original Chinese teaching into English or assist with video editing, please email service at 360sunrise.com. Thank you.